we've got double Nicholson here. I have to ask, which one was your favorite Jack? Was it President Jack or Sleazy Jack? I think I'm going to classic Jack, the the president. Yeah, he's uh he's he's also sleazy in a way, but it's kind of like a different way. It's a weird sleazy. It it feels more like a traditional Jack Nicholson for you. I I was going to ask you if that's kind of why this movie was made. Like I wondered if Jack Nicholson and Tim Burton were like d- each other or something and then they decided to make a film because i was like what is this piece of shit no i think uh, dude i'll tell you why it was made this movie was made because tim burton in the early 90s was on an incredible hot streak of like majorly successful movies guy was just hot like fire so we have this giant star-studded cast all these a-listers just jumping over themselves to fucking be in the next tim burton movie probably expecting that it was going to be like some giant hit instead of like a fucking poor man's independence day parody it did seem like a way, um, <laughs> way, a really horrible Independence Day. That's what it kind of reminded me of as we go through. And I guess I will get into that a little bit more. Oh, yeah. It did not compare favorably. Welcome to Bad Movies and Beer, by the way. I'm Cooper. And I'm Nolan. And if you haven't gathered from, uh, you know, our talking so far, this week we are discussing Mars Attacks, the movie that, in my opinion, really signaled the downfall of Tim Burton. This is where he just fell off. Did he have? He's probably had some good films after this, too. But this was sort of the end of his peak. Uh, I I might dispute the fact that he's had good films after this. Like, there are some people out there who are big, like, Sweeney Todd fans. But this is... He, after this, he kind of started getting up his own ass with, like, Johnny Depp movies where it's just like, oh, I'll have Johnny Depp play this weirdo and, like, whatever. Like, this is- <laughs> I know. I, I looked at this movie and I, I actually questioned why we were doing it. When you said we were going to be watching it, I thought... This has got to be a good movie. Tim Burton, uh, that huge cast. It's like, who do we have in here? We got Michael J. Fox. We got Sarah Jessica Parker. Pierce Brosnan. Yeah. Like, this thing DeVito, is... DeVito, Annette Bening, Glenn Close. Yeah. So, it was sort of funny. I thought, this this can't really go wrong. And even when it sort of swings in, it starts out pretty goofy. But we get some really good music from Danny Elfman, too, right? I was like, oh, man, this thing is going to come together. No, man. Huge bomb. Huge disaster. Yeah. Which, like, when you think about it now, it's based on a series of, like, children's trading cards from the early 1960s, which, like, I'm sure some people remember fondly, but, like... Okay, I was going to ask, yeah, what what was the inspiration for it? Because it did remind me of poor Independence Day, as we already talked about, and I, it also gave me sort of feelings of, like, War of the Worlds um, and The Day the Earth Stood Still, those kind of, like, classic alien movies. It felt like that, and I guess now that you're letting me know it's coming from trading cards, that makes sense. Huge mistake, as it turned out. <laughs> oh. So bad. It's so bad. So uh, I have a little story about this movie. I was talking to my wife about it, and she had seen it before I hadn't. This is my first watching. She had went to see it with her family at the movie theater when it came out. Me too, buddy. Opening night, I was there. They walked out. Oh, no. Yeah. Like, I think pretty far into it, when you take four children and two adults to the movies and buy them snacks and stuff, that's an expensive evening to not stick through a movie. Goddamn. Well, there you go. Uh, and that's bad because that's the, that's kids with the target audience man that's that's who you're hoping for will enjoy this based on the ridiculous early cg aliens and all the you know slapstick comedy we get from them but that all comes later uh before we get to that how perfectly themed a beer do we have today for this movie oh it's amazing so uh, we are going to be drinking two beers for this movie which i'm excited about um doubling up doubling up uh it's the zap sour ipa from nickel book brewing uh, it features a laser gun uh, on the cover. And then the second one we're going to be drinking is also a Zap Sour, but it's the Pink Lemonade Sour IPA. So uh, we're going to be taking those both down as we record today. And we'll let you know uh, some more about the brewery and about the beers themselves as we sort of get to the end of our podcast today. So let's get into it. I'm dying to. Let's do it. <laughs> So we get a nice touch to start as we see the WB logo, which of course is floating up in the sky and a flying saucer goes by. I'm like, that's pretty cool. Like, that's a good little introduction to what's going to happen here. Yeah, it shows you kind of to expect you're going to get some clever connections and fun stuff. It is a burden movie, so you're expecting kind of some creativity in the way they play with the traditional things that are in the movie. Definitely, and never in my wildest dreams did I expect us to open on a farmhouse, uh, which we are told is four miles outside of Lockjaw, Kentucky. <laughs> we've got uh, we've got a redneck who asks a homeowner, Mr. Lee, if it is the Filipino New Year's because he smells him cooking up a feast. But no, turns out it's a whole herd of cattle that are on fire. Boy, they really got to that casual Asian racism quickly. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I don't know how that popped in there. Um, 
we see these characters who we don't really ever see again. So it's kind of funny they start off here. But yeah, we start off real fast. They're telling us that aliens are here and they don't seem that friendly if they're sort of torching a whole bunch of cows. No. And then we get the opening credits over a uh, point of view shot from Mars looking at Earth as just hundreds of saucers rise from the planet. And again, just a star-studded cast. They just keep snapping off these names and it's like... How did this miss, man? Yeah, great dramatic space music. Um, You can hear the Danny Elfman score starting to build and come in already. The spaceships themselves uh, are very traditional in their UFO shape, but they kind of have a neat movement and sort of spin to them. I like the way that they did that. You see them all piling out of Mars, and they're on their way. And at this time, I even wrote in my notes as well, how does this go so wrong? Well, we're going to find out very soon. From there, we cut to Washington, D.C. It's May 10th, 1125 a.m., President Jack Nicholson looking at grainy footage of the saucers. He asks his cabinet for advice. Now, this is the best character in the movie to me is his press secretary, Jerry, played by Martin Short, doing a fantastic job of playing like a sleazy publicist. Just great stuff. Yeah, yeah he, he does pull off this smarmy press secretary for sure. It's definitely over the top, but what do you expect from a Martin Short performance, right? You know what's coming there. That's the perfect role for him to do it. It's a great use of his talents. Yeah, they did pick him in the right spot. His character thinks people are going to love it. A general there, played by Rod Steiger, Hollywood legend, who I believe once played General Patton in the movie Patton, he thinks they need to launch an immediate assault. And the scientific professor, Pierce Brosnan, believes that the aliens' advanced technology is proof, of course, that they must be peaceful. The president considers their various opinions and decides to go with Jerry. He's going with Martin Short, and he wants a good speech. In his words, statesmanlike, historical, and yet warm and neighborly. Abraham Lincoln meets Leave it to Beaver. You know the sort of thing. (laughs) Yes, sir. (laughs) <laughs> so he does a lot of big speeches here. This kind of reminded me of the other movie we watched with it, a, a famous American president, right? It threw us back to Roosevelt in, in our... <laughs> <laughs> I felt like when they conceptualized this movie, that was going to be a big part of the sales was, okay, Jack Nicholson's going to get to show off his acting chops as the president and give these huge speeches. And in that case, it's a really great piece of casting in that regard, because I remember as a kid being excited about it, things would be great. Even watching it now, I was like, This is a good, like, good thing for Jack Nicholson to be in this movie. He's really, he's kind of hamming it up a little bit, but, like, it fits. It fits that blustering presidential character. Really enjoyed it. We also meet the first lady, played by Glenn Close. She's doing some kind of home shopping while her unimpressed daughter, played by a very young Natalie Portman, looks on. Uh, We cut to Las Vegas. We're going to spend some time in this movie. We've got a former boxer, played by Jim Brown, who's getting his picture taken with some nuns. Apparently, these nuns have always been fight fans, you see. That's the joke there. (laughs) Yeah, there's going to be a lot of sort of different characters or stories that we follow throughout that are going to be impacted by here. And this is where I started thinking about movies like Armageddon or Independence Day, right? Like, this feels like that, but in a strangely kind of funny way. Well, it hasn't felt funny yet. It's sort of, it's still trying to build in that same kind of connected people before the aliens invade. Yeah, if the the nuns loving boxing is indicative of the kind of comedy we're going to get from this movie. This is where I'm kind of like, ooh, we might be in trouble here. (laughs) Yeah. But they continue snapping off these characters. He gets a call from his ex-wife, played by the lovely and talented Pam Greer, about uh, their two sons who apparently haven't really been going to school. He kind of shrugs it off as like a boys will be boys thing. Also at the casino, Jack Nicholson in his second role as the sleazy kind of like Southern entrepreneur. He's opening his own casino. He was building the Galaxy Casino. I Uh, called him the crook cowboy. I like it. Meanwhile, his sort of like earth conscious girlfriend is with them, uh, played by Annette Benning. She's kind of like playing like a like a drunken hippie floozy kind of thing here. If she seems like a Westerner who has like embraced pieces of Eastern sort of culture. One of those like early kind of co-option kind of feelings. Yeah, like a very spirit, like a spiritualism kind of thing. Let's just say it. A lot of white women with money <laughs> kind of get into that sort of thing, right? And so yeah, this she's is, sort she's, of embracing she's, that. And then we're going to get more character introduction here. Who else do we see? God, they're coming fast and furious. Like you said, we get two more. Uh, Sarah Jessica Parker, who is playing a talk show host. She's about to have her show interrupted by the president. She calls her boyfriend, played by Michael J. Fox, who works at a different television network, to let him know. The announcement by the president is, of course, about these aliens. And we also see another character as a teenager named Richie, played by Lucas Haas, who is watching from like a sleepy donut shop in the middle of the desert. You know who's not watching this announcement, though? 
Danny DeVito, who is more concerned <laughs> with gambling. He's, he's throwing, throwing craps. He's uh, rolling and winning, but everyone around him is stopped for this important presidential announcement. This is classic Danny DeVito being the like comic relief here. He shows up here, though, and then we almost don't see him again until, like, the very end of the movie. I actually asked in my notes partway through, I was like, where's Danny? I was I was waiting for it to come back. Well, if you look at, like, the movie poster, the uh, like the commercials for any of this, he's, like, the fifth name. Yeah. He's above the title. He's in this movie for, like, five minutes. Like, it's so weird. Like, apparently his star was burning so bright in, like, 1993 or 4 or whenever this was, or 5 or 6. Or... <laughs> it was 96, I think. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was, I just, I thought a bigger role for him, too, especially considering he was on that front cover. Nope, not happening. The next morning, we see Michael J. Fox, here, Jessica Parker, they're having breakfast. They get a phone call for her to interview Pierce Brosnan about these aliens. And again, Michael J. Fox just uh, really unhappy with this turn of events. I guess the J and Michael J. Fox stands for jealousy. <laughs> oh, you were proud of yourself for that one. Oh, huh? I love it. From there, we cut to Richie from the donut shop. He's arriving back at his trailer home where we meet his brother, an incredibly young and skinny Jack Black. He's practicing assembling his rifle. It turns out he's joining the military and can't wait to potentially shoot some aliens. This character's funny. It felt to me very Forrest Gumpy. Like, I felt like that he was directly trying to sort of play a comedic version of Forrest Gump. To me, very stock kind of like sort of dim-witted redneck character. It's interesting. At this point, after we saw him, I started to question why some of the Vegas people and why some of the people in this sort of trailer park started to get shown. I was wondering if these were going to be the people who fight against those Martians. And as we see, it's partially that, right, as we move through the movie. Speaking of connections to Independence Day, this is exactly like Independence Day, like Randy Quaid playing like kind of like a redneck, like trailer park dude ends up having to fight the aliens. So it, there's so many similarities here. Like, I don't know how this happened. No, no. And it's hard because having seen that, enjoyed that movie, watching what's happening here, even though it's supposed to be a comedy and not serious, it's not coming off well. No. And here's one of the problems when you have like 20 f-ing characters in a movie. We start getting these like short scenes in quick succession where you're trying to establish like character, but you can't really develop that much of the characters. We, we spend like three minutes at a time with these people. Speaking of which, we get a quick scene of Pam Greer driving a bus. She's a bus driver. Spots her two sons skipping school, pulls the bus over, reams them out. All the passengers cheer for her. Then we immediately cut to Martin Short picking up a hooker which uh, was delightful. And we'll come up again later. That part's actually kind of important. <laughs> yeah, I at this time I was like, what the f*** was that scene for? They were just trying to show how smarmy he was. Well, yeah, like Washington scandals, right? There's always something yeah, like that. Yeah, they just where, yeah. have him uh, grabbing some ladies of the night and put him in a limo. And Yeah, man. We also get another scene of Jim Brown. He asks his boss for a raise, but his boss denies him the raise, says he could get Leon Spinks or Buster Douglas for the same money, maybe even less. From there, we go to the Pierce Brosnan interview, and he and Sarah Jessica Parker heavily flirting. He claims he loves her show, but I kind of smell bullshit on that one. What's the chance this fucking science guy is watching her show, which I think is about like fashion? It comes up later, though, and he says again that he has watched her show and like been pining after her. So Yeah, but I feel like that's just... like Her character in this is the kind of person who would respond so well to that, right? Like, the flattery yeah. will get you everywhere you kind think, of thing. You think Brosnan's just laying it on thick here? Well, let's just call a spade a spade. This show is horseshit. Like, we, we immediately <laughs> see her start reading questions, like, direct from Q cards and doing like a so-so job yeah, she actually knows nothing about the doctor himself or any of that but she's definitely attracted to pierce brosnan's smoldering good looks who can blame her the man is handsome objectively you can't deny that we see the president and first lady watching the show with some tv dinners so is michael j fox and he doesn't like it especially when the martians cut in on the signal and the last thing he sees is pierce brosnan put his hand on sarah jessica parker's leg he went in for a thigh grab and you know that's, uh, Unlike the Martian invasion of Earth, there was no resistance on that thing. No. In fact, she leaned into him for a hug as the aliens started to take over. He needed to comfort her. Well, exactly right. When this happens, the Martian leader starts talking, but not in a language that anyone understands. And this apparently was a thing in the production of this movie where they wanted to have subtitles for what the aliens were saying, but Tim Burton like fought against this. But this alien dialogue is like cartoony. It's basically just them saying ack, ack, ack over and over again. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's interesting. I, I kind of like that we didn't know what was being said, whether we were trying to interpret whether it was going to be threatening or not threatening. It did sort of like a circle thing with its fingers. The universal sign for the donut is what Richie, the character, says. (laughs) 
<laughs> yes. Uh, it reminded me of like crop circles or some kind of communication. It was it was interesting um, for sure to see that come in. The alien itself was really comical. And I guess that was because it was supposed to be a comedy sci-fi movie. They just had a giant, giant cranium, huge head, big eyes, um, and wearing it sort of flashy space suit well and again we're talking very early like cgi here right so these aliens do not look even remotely realistic they they look funny they're they're cartoon sort of pictures and as we start seeing them more and even when we get into their spaceship this feels very much like sci-fi willy wonka okay um i don't know how much sci-fi he's done before burton? Like, do you know any other tim burton sci-fi no I, most of his stuff is kind of like vaguely gothic like horror comedy yeah and it doesn't it doesn't pull it off well for me right like his sort of sensibilities don't seem to work in a sci-fi for me i agree but i really think in this he's going more comedy like this is trying to be like because the aliens they're they're not meant i mean what they do we're going to see what they do very soon they they don't seem like menacing even when they are like evaporating people they are yeah yeah, they they are little cartoon characters doing that so but they're not haha funny. Like I, oh I God, never, no. I didn't laugh when they came, or I didn't like it. It didn't come off that way, and I don't know if I just didn't get the sense of humor, but it didn't work for me. Well, if you didn't, neither did anyone else, because this movie fucking bombed at the box office. So <laughs> it's not just you. Scientist Pierce Brosnan, based on barely any information, just starts making wild assumptions. I suspect they have more to fear from us than we from them. Boy, is he wrong about that one. (laughs) Another scientist attempts to create a decoding device like a translator, which produces very mixed results. One of the phrases that comes out of this thing is, dark is the suede that mows the harvest. And if I could go back in time and change my high school yearbook quote, let me tell you, <laughs> that would be it. it sounds <laughs> so wise, even good. though it means nothing. I felt like 1996, I could have done a better job of creating a machine that looked like it could translate. Like, the thing itself looked like a piece of shit, but yeah. I think that was probably <laughs> yeah. intentional. I'm sure that's the idea. You're right. Yep. We cut from there to Annette Benning. She's at an AA meeting. Uh, she's apparently three months sober and very optimistic about the Martian arrival. She gets a round of applause from the predominantly male uh, church group, who I feel like might have just been applauding her. It was definitely this very large group of men (laughs) who were cheering on her perspective, which I don't think would happen. Um, It's here that I start complaining about how long the character building's happening. It was already, like, overwhelming, right? The number of people they introduced and how little they could actually spend with them, yet how long it was taking was making this thing drag and not be that interesting, right? You were sort of hoping, we we start off with the burning cows, and we haven't even had an alien sort of interaction, and we're probably a good, like, 45 minutes into this movie. It's a ton, and there's more character building coming. We cut to Jack Black, who's heading off to the army base. His whole family's there, along with uh, his girlfriend, who I think is played by Christina Applegate. Oh, I completely missed that. I'm pretty sure it was. They go there to see him off. Brother Richie, the whole family is disappointed that he isn't more like his brother Jack Black. But when Richie drives his grandmother home, we find out that she loves him, even if she doesn't know she's talking to him. She's calling him Thomas, which she also calls multiple characters. So that's kind of sweet. At least he's got one relative that's on his side. I had a problem with this grandma character. Okay. I don't like dementia humor. Like, I don't think it's funny. I think, again, in terms of some of the humor they're getting at, they had racist humor and now they have dementia humor. I don't love it. Yeah, you, you'll get no argument from me. Um, when Richie drops his grandmother off at her nursing home, she puts on the soothing country falsetto of Slim Whitman, and all of this comes into play in a big way later on. Mm-hmm. Speaking of what you were saying about inappropriate jokes and comments, we we get a press conference. We have like an androgynous reporter who stands up and asks if the Martians have two sexes like we do, and the president and Martin Short just stare at this reporter with like their mouths open. And that is the whole scene. And I'm like, this is what this was? This was just set up like a trans joke? I'm not sure about that. Like, that's not really cool. No, I wasn't a fan of that piece either. Um, There's a lot of those that pop into this movie. And I guess that is just sort of where some of the humor was at the time in the 90s when this was happening. But yeah, I didn't laugh at all. And those things definitely do not age well. And that's, again, true of many movies that we've seen. It's, uh, you know... From there, we go to the other Jack Nicholson, the sleazy casino owner. He sees Jim Brown's boxer character jogging and invites him into the limo to pitch him on a job. He wants him to rough up someone who owes him money. But Jim Brown doesn't want to because he's a new man. In fact, he gave up pork. That's one of the things he indicates that he's turned his life around. Well, he did say also in that quote that that was because he has become like a Muslim. Ah, f***. All right. Well, that's a lot less funny now. <laughs> Thanks. They do, Thanks yeah. <laughs> they, they do make a joke out of it, right? Like, it it comes up again, and they make a joke about the pork. So, not only are they making fun of transgender people, people with dementia, 
making fun now people, um, Muslim people, Asian people. Right? We already had an Asian yep. people joke. So Tim Burton is really struggling for good comedy here. Or maybe it's just meant to show that these characters are predominantly like bad people so that you won't feel bad when they die later. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's like character setup. So when they get zapped by the Martians, you're kind of almost in the Martian side being like, okay, good. You just like and kill everyone it's kind of like my feeling at the end of godzilla there <laughs> there you go so we've had all of this build up um and we're finally about to get an interaction between the people and the aliens we are you are correct the alien ships are ready to land now again general rod steiger really wants to send troops but pierce brosnan thinks it's a bad idea it sends the wrong message President Jack Nicholson listens to him puts the other general Jenny general casey in charge this is kind of a uh, meek uh guy who we haven't really heard much from he's kind of just there in the room General Rod Steiger, as grumpy, stomps off into the White House, angrily complaining, and he wakes up a very annoyed Natalie Portman, who, her character in this is, like, paper thin. Yeah, they don't give her a lot. She just seems like a disgruntled teenager whose parents, um, like, live in the White House, are the president and the first lady. Yeah, if there's a perspective there that she's supposed to be giving, they don't do a great job of really providing it. No, they just show that she's sort of grumpy at the situation in general, but that's about it. So it's the big day. People are excited. There are bleachers set up with a Welcome to Earth banner. And General Casey, who tells his wife he knew that if he'd stayed in place and never spoke up, he'd eventually get an opportunity like this. He lectures his men about how this needs to run smoothly. But unfortunately, this plan hinges on the same translator that brought us the Dark Suede, so I am less optimistic than him. So as I see all these people assembling, I, I know immediately that they're just going to get their asses fried, right? This is going to be Zap City. Oh, it's got to to drive this plot ahead for sure. Yeah. Michael J. Fox and Sarah Jessica Parker are also there for news coverage. And Annette Benning has driven out to the desert to watch this from the hood of her car, believing this will be this historic transcendent moment that she is waiting for. Finally, the flying saucer lands and Sarah Jessica Parker likens it to a giant hubcap. <laughs> yeah, she's so descriptive. Um. The animation of the spaceship is okay, like, as the landing gear comes down and the walkway unfurls, I'm like, okay. It looks sort of cartoony, but it, it works well for what they're trying to pull off. Yeah, you mentioned that at the beginning, too, and I agree with that. The flying saucers look pretty decent. The aliens, however, they disembark this ship, and they are, like, not quite, like, a reboot level of uncanny, but it's pretty close. It's bad. I, I called them ludicrous. Like, they, it was just so awful in my notes. I was like, yeah, this is bad. Yeah. So as the nation watches, the general goes to greet them. He makes the same circle motion their leader did when he interrupted Sarah Jessica Parker's show and welcomes them to Earth. Apparently, according to the translator, they come in peace. Then some dirty hippie releases a dove and the dove triggers them. Out come the laser guns and they shoot f***ing everybody. <laughs> yeah, so first the dove takes it and then that general who uh, hadn't spoken up, right, who had been in the background and done what he was supposed to to get ahead, just gets melted on TV. And when they get zapped, the effect is actually kind of okay. You see like a flame happen and then their body kind of disintegrate and just their bones are left and they're often the color of the ray gun that shot them. I, I didn't hate that. I thought that was kind of effective. That was decent, yeah. Now, the the weapons themselves that they're zapping everyone with, they look like super soakers. And I wondered if that <laughs> yeah, was man, intentional, yeah. right? I was like, they just took some super soakers off the shelf of Toys R Us and threw them in the hand of the cast and pretended they were uh, zap guns. Well, again, the effect, like you mentioned, pretty good. Many people die here. The general, also young Jack Black, who it turns out is great at assembling rifles, but not so much at shooting them. When he goes to shoot, he accidentally hits the clip release and it falls out and he is now unarmed. And they even get Michael J. Fox. So maybe tough times for Sarah Jessica Parker, although I kind of have a feeling she's going to land on her feet. Even tougher, she gets abducted by the aliens. They take her off in the spaceship as they head off after sort of demolishing most of the people who were there. Oh, yeah. Now, the president wants to know what the next move is. General Rod Steiger once again says nuke them. But scientist Pierce Brosnan really sticking to his guns says, let's not be too rash. This might be a cultural misunderstanding. Now, the first lady, who is intelligent, sides with the general and is like, we should <laughs> destroy them. But the daughter, Natalie Portman, she sides with Pierce Brosnan. The president goes with them. He sends the alien leaders a message through the translator. And we see the message get received in the flying saucer, where we learn that the uniform worn by the vast majority of the alien crew is a red Speedo. <laughs> Just banana hammocks I mean everywhere. <laughs> 
<laughs> like, was this casual Friday? Is this how they dress when they're relaxing? Like, what is this? Why are those guys walking around fucking topless wearing like, you know? Aliens don't have the same kind of fear of their bodies that humans do. They, they like to flaunt it. I'm, I was surprised they actually had them on. He should have just had them hang a dong or whatever they have down there. Maybe these were European aliens. Yeah. Well, they definitely seem like European. <laughs> it was, yeah. Maybe we were almost nude beach aliens. I think where they were. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, it man. is weird when you think about those decisions, right? Like, yeah. why are they in the shiny clothes? Why banana hammocks for their outfits I on the spaceship? Know. Yeah. Uh, anyway, the leaders read the message from Jack Nicholson, uh, and they laugh their alien asses off. And Sarah Jessica Parker, as you mentioned, they have plans for her, but uh, they are weird plans. They're going to switch her head with that of her tiny dog, which bizarre. Yeah, I don't understand that choice. That just because maybe this is at the time where you could kind of do that with um, computer animation or something. Like, they just made the choice to do it because they could. Yeah, you may be right. Maybe that's what it was. That's a good call. We get some more quick scenes now. Uh, Sleazy Jack Nicholson hasn't even noticed any of this. He's really focused on that casino launch. Pierce Brosnan does an alien autopsy. And Jim Brown checks in with Pam Greer to let her know that he'll be arriving in Washington tomorrow. When it turns out his kids are going to the White House, which... That is probably not going to be good. Why is there a fucking trip to the White House during an alien invasion? Great question. Yeah, I had that same thought. You would never be running tours or especially bringing children to the White House at this time. Unless, for plot purposes, you need kids who like playing video games to shoot lasers. Yeah, we did see them playing video games earlier and, uh, you know. Oh, I'm I'm yelling at the TV right now. <laughs> like, I, I was seriously sitting there being like, you, Tim Burton. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, that night, the Martians send a formal apology to Earth. Apparently, they feel terrible about all of this and want to speak to Congress. President Jack Nicholson's excited again, calls it a great victory for their administration. Now, the next day, the saucer lands. Soldiers are holding up signs that say no applause and also no birds. And that was actually kind of funny. <laughs> that made me chuckle a little I bit. laughed at that sign, too. I yeah. thought it was good. Uh, it's a hell of a photo op, they say, but the president won't be there because the Secret Service doesn't want the executive branch and the legislative branch in the same room, you know, in case something happens. Yeah, oh, nothing's going to happen in this Senate area where the aliens are coming, is it? No, of course not. Uh, oh, wait, that's not correct. The Martian ambassadors shoot everyone. They are zapping everyone, right? This is where the name of this beer fits perfectly. You're just seeing laser shots everywhere. Except Pierce Brosnan who, even in the face of them just eviscerating the entire f***ing Congress, is like, this doesn't make any sense. You're advanced. You must be peaceful. And they're just like, what's this f***ing guy's deal? And they take him. Um, so it's about two catastrophes too late, but the president is finally ready to listen to General Rod Steiger. Uh, except he isn't really, since he says he doesn't want to start a war. Now, the general correctly points out they are already at war, but the president doesn't want to hear it. Instead, he gives an impassioned yet delusional speech about how he wants to let the people know that they're doing okay. And his exact quote is, I want the people to know that they still have two out of three branches of the government working for them, and that ain't bad. Little meatloaf <laughs> song reference so, there. Is that what it was? I yeah, when man, two he out of three it, bad. Oh, okay, because when he said it, I was like, I know that quote, but I couldn't pull it from anywhere. It was just so familiar to her. But yeah, he's pretty delusional here. He does not want to attack these aliens still, even though they have gone and killed his general and a bunch of Americans and then wiped out the Senate. So it's it's pretty interesting where this is going. I mean, how are they not listening to this f***ing guy at this point? Yeah. Uh, Pierce Brosnan wakes up on the alien shuttle, only now he's just ahead. His head has been removed from his body, and uh, also he sees Sarah Jessica Parker's head, which is now on her dog's body, as you mentioned earlier, and they confirm that they were, in fact flirting with each other earlier i mean in a way that's kind of lucky because now that they're both like just heads who else is gonna date them <laughs> yeah i'm serious it is lucky i agree they don't have a lot of options now that their genitalia is not attached to them or she's only got dog genitalia <laughs> and he has none um, none yet but, <laughs> who knows well, who knows what they're gonna on. attach to him right he yeah. could get like an otter or something who knows what he's gonna become <laughs> attached to <laughs> that was a uh, random pull by the way i don't know that's a great choice nature's <laughs> rascal we cut from this scene to a very strange looking lady with an extremely tall hairdo who is walking the streets of Washington, D.C. at night. Q. Martin Short, who pulls up in his limo and tries to leverage his high level position for sex by offering her a personalized tour of the White House. She's an alien spy and he should realize that. But you know what? We've all, at one time or another, thought with our penises instead of with our brains. So I'm going to give him a pass. You're just going to let... Yeah, Martin Short had no idea 
the alien that sort of looks like a woman um, is moving strangely. He calls it graceful. He, he likes it. And he brings her back to the White House and even takes her into the secret Kennedy room. So we're getting oh, a joke. F- this was incredible. Oh. Yeah, he, he like <laughs> tilts the head back on a bust of JFK. And like flips a switch, kind of like the uh, the way they'd enter the Batcave in the old like fucking Batman TV show. It opens up a hidden sex room, which of course is <laughs> called the Kennedy Room. Like there, this humor is like really low hanging fruit. Oh goodness, yes. There's a there's a nice sort of fish tank with tropical fish in it. There's a circular bed, animal prints <laughs> all over it. And here we're gonna get a Tim Burton sex scene. Yeah, Martin Short is like super aggressive here. He's ready to make this thing happen. He ends up getting a finger bitten off for his trouble when he tries to pull like her chewing gum out of her mouth. So the gum is what was take- keeping her alive. So when he tried to take it out to make out with her, that was sort of his last act as a a human, right? He gets that finger bit off, and then uh, I think she smokes him in the head with a statue, and that's the end of Martin Short. Yeah, he tries to call for help, and she puts a stop to that. And now she's loose in the White House. She gets as far as the president's bedroom where she finds the sleeping president and first lady and is about to kill them when the dog wakes up and barks. The Secret Service manages to take her down, which greatly angers the Martian leader. So goodbye, Speedos. Hello, combat suits. The Martians are preparing for war. It's like a mini gear up montage. Was it enough to excite you or no? No, this is where it really felt like a sort of Willy Wonka-esque kind of thing, right? We the, the actual gear up with the machines and suits, and we get this giant, like, can-opening robot thing you see sort of starting to light up. I'm really not enjoying the Tim Burton sci-fi here. Yeah. Um, it is a full-scale invasion, though. They are attacking the White House, in which James Brown's kids just happen to be in the middle of their tour, and you'll never believe it, but they snag a couple of those ray guns and use their video game skills to start zapping aliens. In fact, they even save the president, kind of. But unfortunately, the first lady doesn't make it. She is crushed, ironically enough, by the Nancy Reagan chandelier. Uh, I face palmed. Like, this was so bad that those kids were there. They were, yeah. of course, going to be the ones to grab those uh, laser guns and to use them against the aliens. I've been yelling all movie, why don't you take the laser guns? They had nobody tried to pick them up and use them <laughs> against know. the aliens. Like, the humans were so useless in this. They really were. And speaking of useless humans, we cut to the other Jack Nicholson who is pitching investors for his casino and wearing just a ridiculous toupee. When in the middle of this pitch, multiple flying saucers appear behind him. We get just an awful scene where the investors are trying to like get his attention and warn him, but he's too busy boasting and thrusting to listen to them. Yeah, it's so bad. I really don't understand why he was even in the movie. Like it didn't lend anything to I found the humor or pushing the story forward. It just seemed like an excuse to blow up a hotel with a douchey like cowboy in it. And you know what? That's exactly what happens. The saucers destroy the casino. So now he's down to one part in this movie. Uh, We cut from there to Tom Jones singing. Uh, He's singing It's Not Unusual, you know, for a change. (laughs) Decided to mix it up, reach into his back catalog. uh, The inclusion of Tom Jones was just another, like, let's get another name in here. There was no reason for him to be in this movie. Well, no. And this is actually interesting because we find out later on that he can, like, fly a plane. I don't know if Tom Jones actually has his pilot's license, but like he's there essentially as a plot device. It's here that we're coming back to Vegas, and I'm sort of wondering where Danny DeVito went. We saw him for one minute of the movie, not even when he was just interrupting the presidential announcement early. We're about to get him back because Jim Brown uh, calls his ex-wife. The call is disconnected. He decides he's got to get to Washington. Right then, Annette Benning shows up and asks if he knows anyone who can fly a plane. Tom Jones' performance gets interrupted by Martians. He runs out into the casino where he meets up with the two of them. And Danny DeVito, and this is where we find out that Tom Jones does know how to fly a plane, because why not? And so, they're off to the private airfield. Uh, It's going to be a little tough, though, because Martians are currently laying waste to the Las Vegas Strip, which is, like, just an excuse to blow up some shit, right? Yeah, you're seeing the sort of scenes of UFOs with satellites on them shooting out lasers and blowing up shit in the Vegas Strip. Yep. And we see the aliens also destroy the donut shop where Richie works. And back at the trailer, his family is gearing up. They're going to defend their home. But Richie decides against their wishes to go pick up grandma from the nursing home. And it's a smart move, it turns out, because the trailer gets promptly destroyed. Even before they attack their trailer, we see a couple aliens looking into another trailer, which happens to be a rocking 
what's happening in that other trailer? Well, Jack Black's, uh, I guess, now ex-girlfriend, since he's dead, is just getting plowed by some other dude. Yeah, and these aliens are just sitting there, and their shields are fogging up as they're watching this sex scene. They oh, even I do, know. like... They have, like, little windshield wipers yeah, they do to windshield clear windshield. Away the, uh, Why are the aliens pervs? We've talked about pervs a lot on this podcast, and they have made these aliens perv. We have them looking at Playboys putting Sarah Jessica Parker into a bikini, and now they are horn-dogging on some people banging in a trailer park. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's a great question. I think it's just, like, cheap comedy, right? Like, we'll have a, like, vaguely sexy laugh and them perving out with the little windshield wipers. It's so hacky. So much of this comedy is just hacky and, like... It's real bad. Tim Burton has it's done comedy, but, like, Beetlejuice had some really funny shit in it, right? Like, yeah. Tim Burton's capable of having movies with funny stuff, but this is just not one of them. All right. Uh, back in Washington, President Jack Nicholson, this is the scene where he gets the call from the president of France, who is excited to announce that he has reached a settlement with the Martian ambassador, and he immediately gets murdered. Finally, this pushes President Jack Nicholson over the edge, and he signs the nuclear order that General Rod Steiger has been pushing for this whole time. They launch their nuclear missiles, but the Martians send out some sort of a like balloon-looking device that absorbs the explosion of the nuclear missiles and turns it into helium? I have no idea what the scene is. Yeah, this is really f***ed up, right? It looks like the alien ship's about to get messed up by a nuke. Why they only shot one nuke is beyond me, right? Like, if you're going to actually send a nuclear attack, you're going to send tons of nukes at this alien spaceship. But they send one, and a balloon machine goes out, catches the explosion to the nuke, shrinks it down, and then the alien sort of leader drinks it and then talks with a high-pitched voice. It was so dumb. Like, not even a chance at a laugh when this happened. I was just sort of grumpy at this. After this, the aliens are not happy with what happened. What do they What do they start doing? Well, this is where we get to the comedy portion of the movie, really, because this is where the aliens start just going around Earth, destroying various landmarks. So we see Big Ben, the Taj Mahal, those uh, stone heads at Easter Island. What happened to you, or how did you feel when you saw Mount Rushmore get to face like that? I know, like, you have those salt and pepper shakers. You're a fan. <laughs> uh... I didn't care for it, but at this point, I, I'm just like, all right, whatever. This movie is just here f***ing trying to be cute. Like, it's not it's not good. It's not a good movie. And that's why we're talking about it on our Bad Movie Podcast. <laughs> it's not even close to a good movie, right? No, I, it's really I not. I have laughed so infrequently in this comedy sci-fi. Usually in a good movie, they'll make you sort of connect to characters, want things to happen to them. None of this is happening for me. No, man. And I saw this in theaters when I was like 12 years old. And I recall at 12 being disappointed. It was the first time I felt disappointed in a movie. I was like, oh, f***, this was terrible. Holy shit. That is a pretty damning statement for But it also might be the reason why there's this podcast. So, you know. Yeah. Um... We go back to the Vegas crew. They're almost at the plane now, but Danny DeVito, for some reason, decides to go rogue. He goes off on his own and is dead like 10 seconds later, which I would really like to see the amount of screen time he has in this movie. If you told me it was less than four minutes, I would not uh, bet against it. We see Richie again. He gets to the nursing home just in time as some aliens are like just about to murder his grandmother in the most hilarious way possible. She's got her headphones on and doesn't notice. So right as they're about to pull this trigger on this giant ray gun, Richie bursts into the room, which causes the grandma to turn her head. And when she does, she pulls out the headphone cord and we hear the same falsetto we heard earlier from Slim Whitman. It rings out now into the room and it causes the alien's head to explode. And I love this because the grandmother is like, Richie, I think these guys are very sick. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of funny um it is funny that the resonance of the voice right of the song yeah, causes their heads to sort of vibrate and then explode we get that kind of feeling this is where i mean every alien movie they just have to find that one thing that's going to shut them down the this, this made me harken back to signs mm. i hated the end of that movie like, I was outraged by it. A lot of people really like that movie. And I love I, that movie. We talked about this earlier. There was an episode where you were like, you suggested that it could be on this podcast. And I was like, it was a huge fucking hit. I know. And I fucking hated that movie. And it was mostly because of the sort of weakness of the aliens at the end of it. You had trouble with the why would aliens with a weakness uh, towards water come to a planet that's like mostly 80% water? water? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, yeah, that drove me insane, right? And so I thought, this is Signs-esque in its weakness. And I, the resonance thing is almost a little bit better than what happened in Signs to me, right? Like, they might not know that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that yeah. yeah. Um, pretty soon we see Richie and his grandma driving through the streets, just blasting out this music and, like, blowing up alien heads. 
we cut from there to the president's war room and we see that aliens have made it into the room. They roll in what we think is a grenade, but it turns out that it's an alien snow globe. Oh, f- man. What was that about? Like, why did that even happen? That was just supposed to be a fake out? Bullshit comedy. It's so awful. The general is finally going to have his moment, we think, because he comes at the aliens with both pistols blazing, but they unleash a weapon that we haven't seen yet that shrinks him down to a tiny size, and then they step on him. And with him and the Secret Service gone, it's just President Jack left. He tries one more impassioned speech. Little people. Why can't we all just get along? And I'm only just now realizing how often Rodney King references like this were like casually thrown into pop culture as jokes and how kind of messed up that is. Like that's f-ed up. Yeah. yeah. This, this scene itself just seems like a Jack Nicholson. Off. Like this, I think is the point of the movie. It was just him and Tim being like, how many opportunities can we give you to give him passion speeches? But I agree with you sort of throwing down those kind of lines in a supposed to be humorous sci-fi movie is not okay. Dude, they were in everything though. As a kid, I heard, why can't we all just get along in so many things? And everyone kind of chuckles. And I'm like, why was this still like a pop culture joke? And the answer, I guess, is racism. Yeah, that's exactly the answer. Um, but I think you're right. I think this is Jack's like big moment where like, they're like, I have some fun with this one, Jack. You're going out. So he just f-ing does it. His speech, it turns out, brings a tear to even the alien leader's eye. But it's a lie, and he fakes him out with a handshake that ends up killing him. This, to me, clear Batman reference, because there's a scene in the Batman where, like, Joker shakes the guy's hand and electrocutes him to death. And here we have Jack Nicholson himself being undone by a handshake when the hand, like, detaches from the alien body, climbs, like, around his back and, like, punctures him through the f***ing chest with, like, a metal spike, essentially. Yeah, it's funny. And then that ends up turning into the flag of the sort of alien or Mars race, right? That hand that peeled off and pulled into a pole ends up planting the flag in America through the president's body, which is kind of a... I guess a humorous way to sort of plant the flag and claim a place for yourself. Yeah, I mean, it's a clever reference, if nothing else. We go from there to the Vegas crew. They've made it to the hangar. Tom Jones and Annette Bening go to start the plane, while Jim Brown and Cindy, a character who up until now has had f***ing zero lines by my count, go to the hangar doors. When they do get to the hangar doors, we see about a dozen aliens, and that's going to be a problem. So Jim Brown goes out there, ditches the f***ing Egyptian clown suit he's wearing for his job in the casino, and takes them on. He fights like the champion he is, but the numbers game is just too much for him. But he buys his friends time enough to escape, and uh, I just hope that Tom Jones someday writes a song about him and his brave sacrifice. (laughs) I mean, I know why they did this scene, because it's supposed to be funny having the boxer punch a bunch of these aliens in their glass heads, and he does take a few down. Why they decide to drop their zap guns and then start punching him back is a question to me. Like, a single one of them could have used a ray gun and killed him instantly, but maybe they wanted that sort of fun or challenge of trying to beat him down. I guess it was all played up for the movie, of course. Definitely. So from there, we see Richie and his grandma. They get to a radio station and start blasting out the Slim Whitman music over the airwaves. Now, the army catches on at this point, and they start using it to kill the aliens as well. We see heads exploding, flying saucers crashing into Earth, and even on the main alien ship, the Martians are just going down, which is bad news, it turns out, for Sarah Jessica Parker and Pierce Brosnan. But at least they get to share, like, a weird goodbye kiss as their heads roll around on the floor. Yeah, this is really f***ed up. Um, I said, why are they making these two random heads kiss each other as this alien ship is going down? I also, Slim Whitman, I guess they're saying that a lot of people dislike country western music, but country western music is what saves the world. I don't think you can say a lot of people dislike it. Country western music is huge, man. I like country western music, but I think that in general... Well, it didn't f***ing sound like it a minute ago. No, no, I'm just saying that it gets it gets shit on a lot, I think. And are we now learning that country western music is going to save us all? This is what I'm saying. There is nothing wrong with country western music. Let me just say that. I agree. No, no, you've made your point very clear. You hate country western music, and uh, it's, <laughs> it's the I did not say it was bad. I said people do not like country western music. I did not say I don't like it. No, your exact quote was, country western music is a bunch of horse shit. <laughs> And uh, this is an ironic Don't put these words in my mouth. Don't put these words in my mouth. We're going back to this weird, headless Uh, kiss for no reason. Like, there's no purpose to have these two kissing. It was weird. Who cares? This this ship crashes into a lake or like something. 
And from there, we dissolve to beautiful country nature. There's squirrels, birds, turtles, deer. As Annette Benning, Tom Jones, and Cindy emerge from one of the uh, Tahoe Caves. Annette Benning wanted she mentioned she wanted to go to the Tahoe Caves. Elsewhere, we get the world cleaning up and mourning and some celebration as the first daughter, Natalie Portman, gives a Congressional Medal of Honor to both Richie and his grandma. Now, I don't know much about the chain of command in uh, American politics, but is there any scenario in which she actually becomes president? She's like 16 f-ing years old, or is this like largely a symbolic thing? Yeah, this is this is bullshit, right? Because, of course, the president's daughter after the president and the first lady die are, is not going to become the one in charge. Although we already saw the Senate wiped out and most of the other generals and all of those things. But yeah, it's kind of funny. They, they have a mariachi band playing like in what's happening in this ceremony and they're sort of on the rubble of one of the Capitol buildings. It's such a strange kind of way to end it. Sorry, just to be clear, uh, are you also shitting on mariachi music? Is that what you were saying a second ago? Why is (laughs) that f***ing band there? I'm not at all. It just seemed like a strange thing to throw in. Well, it's it's probably short notice. You're trying to get someone right away. Who knows who's even still alive? I mean, It it felt like they were making fun of mariachi music to me is what I felt like. Okay, it felt like you were making fun of mariachi (laughs) music to me a second ago. You keep Um, putting words in my mouth in this episode. You piece of shit. Either way... uh, (laughs) Richie gets a kiss in the cheek from the lady president and gives an awkward speech. And then President Portman asks him if he's got a girlfriend. So I guess he's getting a happy ending too. Literally, perhaps. Or is that figuratively? I don't even fucking know. Uh, the movie ends, though, with Pam Greer and Jim Brown's kids. They're cleaning up what's left of their apartment. They drop an alien body down onto the street where its head quickly gets stepped on and crushed by... Jim Brown, he's alive. He somehow survived fighting those aliens and getting overwhelmed. We get a quick cut back to Tom Jones, surrounded by nature, as an eagle lands on his arm and he starts to dance. As we once again hear the unmistakable horn intro, if it's not unusual, which takes us to the credits. What the f***? <laughs> like, I couldn't believe that it ended on Tom Jones with animals around him and Eagle Landing and that song. In addition like, to being able to fly planes, Tom Jones can summon nature is what I'm learning. Apparently, yes, I agree. He's a druid. We've learned that Tom <laughs> Jones is a f***ing <laughs> druid. <laughs> I don't know why he didn't use his nature powers to kill the aliens, but he didn't. You know, it's weird. I don't think I had seen this since I watched it as a kid in theaters, and... Watching it back now, I like I felt the same kind of disappointment all over again. I guess we'll get to that in a second because we've pretty much reached the point where it's time for us to rate this movie. We rate it twice on a scale of 1 to 10, once for how bad it is, once for how enjoyable it is. And the goal, as always, is to find movies that are a 10 or a 10 on both scales, or as we call it, the Crit, crit 20. 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. And for me, I can't give it a 10 out of 10 bad, but I am going to say it is 9 out of 10 bad. This is a pretty bad f***ing movie. It felt like this was an idea that someone just wanted to do, like a passion project, maybe for Tim Burton. And because he was hot, all these stars signed on. But at the end of the day, a movie based on children's trading cards, there's not a lot of meat on that bone. And between introducing all these characters in these like short, clippy scenes, you don't really have a lot of time to actually build relationships with these people. And then you get to like the early CG, like kind of comedy alien attacks. The whole time, I'm not invested in these characters. I'm not invested in what's happening because there's a real barrier for me in terms of realism between like what I'm seeing on screen and whether I actually believe that any of this is possibly happening. I was just really unimpressed. So I'm going to give it a 9 or 10 for how bad it was. What about you? I'm not going to argue with you. It was awful. Um, Going in, I had expectations that it was going to be decent based on the cast and crew and like the director, the music, the sound. And there was very little redeeming elements to this movie at all. I didn't laugh. Like, I didn't find it funny. I didn't find any of the performances particularly stand out, right? Of course, there were some characters who played sort of in their wheelhouse, but... Martin Short was good, I thought. Martin Short played in his wheelhouse. Jack Nicholson played in his wheelhouse. But, like, none of that really made me enjoy the movie in any way. And we're going to talk about enjoyment in a second. But I actually had it as a 10 bad. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, I thought it deserved to be right up there because with all of the stuff that they had at their disposal, they really messed this one up. Well, again, this is this is where the wheels on his career really came off for me. Like, he was on this undeniable hot streak, 
great movie after great movie, and then all of a sudden it's this, and it's kind of like, okay, you, like sometimes guys kind of get like too big, and I feel like a lot of directors have that thing where once they become hot, then all these celebrities are jumping over themselves to work with them, and a lot of times the movie that comes out next is like one of the worst ones they produce because they've just gotten, like, they've flown too close to the sun in a manner of speaking. This kind of happens um, in a lot of sort of things that people create, right? It happens with books as well, where when you have a certain status, people are afraid to edit you. Yeah. Right? They're afraid to take things out and change things. And I feel like that happened here. I feel like nobody wanted to tell Tim Burton no. And because of that, this just did not come out as an effective movie right it ends up being one of the worst he's ever made a victim of his own success you might say yeah absolutely dark is the suede that moves the harvest (laughs) so that's how bad this movie was you have a 10 out of 10 my gosh this is actually in play for you how enjoyable on a scale of 1 to 10 it's not going to be a crit 20 yeah you know already right based on my comments about this that it was not a 10 enjoyable right i really struggled to get through this So much character building, yet I didn't sort of connect with any character. There wasn't enough time because there were so many. I didn't find the aliens or their ray guns or the way they killed or shot fun or funny in any way. There were a couple decent performances. The Danny Elfman music um, was was good. I mean, he didn't f*** it up in the way that sort of the rest of this movie kind of ended. But I, I had it as a four enjoyable. That's real close to me. I have it as a five. Again, as a kid who loved Tim Burton at the time, I had wildly high expectations. And sometimes when you go with high expectations, you're disappointed and you kind of reflect on things like more poorly than they should be. But here I am 20 years later, I went in with low expectations and it still didn't meet those. I was still disappointed. They really squandered this all-star cast. Like there were people I was excited to see what they would do. We're getting them for brief glimpses. Like we said, Danny DeVito, maybe like less than five minutes. Not an enjoyable thing. I'm giving it a five out of 10 bad. So that's kind of where I'm at. Now, luckily for both of us, not disappointing, this delicious f-ing beer. So uh, we got the two Zaps here, the regular Zap Sour, and we've got the pink lemonade one, which has lemon um, zest and pink guava. And I really like the addition of that guava. Oh, yeah, it kind strongly of takes a prominent recommend. Role in it's the like sour. tart, refreshing, uh, if you like sours. The original Zap Sour is like, it's the first sour beer I ever tasted. Is that true? Uh, you actually introduced yeah, me to it. Yeah, did I give it to you? Yeah, that you was the first, so that's, yeah. So this was your gateway to like some of our craft beers, right? I started you on sours because I yeah. thought that was how you'd get in. I knew kind of the... Yeah, but only afterwards did I realize, looking at the can, that it says sour IPA. I'm like, this motherfucker, you tried to backdoor me into IPAs <laughs> with some fucking sour flavor up front. One of the things I'd say about the sour IPA is I think it leans way heavier on the sour side. Oh, definitely, yes. I kind of struggle with calling them IPAs in that sense because they don't taste uh, or finish like IPAs, but I love sours as well. So, you know, these were very enjoyable to drink. I like kind of hitting both and comparing them. Nickelbrook Brewery, I love that place. It was one of the very first craft breweries I ever visited. It actually started out as a brew your own beer and wine place. Okay. And then as the craft beer industry in Ontario started to grow, they become one of the first to sort of take off and get fairly large. Uh, they've expanded their space, and they're actually making a, a brand new large one in Toronto this year, too. So uh, lots more ways to get Nickelbrook. So pretty cool. Burlington, Ontario. Gotta love them. Speaking of things you gotta love, next week, we are going to be tackling our first ever black exploitation movie. Ooh. We are going to watch the Rudy Ray Moore classic, The Human Tornado. It's the sequel to Dolomite. Are you familiar with the Dolomite films? I have never seen any of them, but I Man, know... Like, what you're talking about you are in for a real treat because rudy ray moore what a creator that man was you're definitely gonna want to check us out next week because the human tornado is something just really really special i knew coming into this podcast with you that i was going to be a part of a world that was going to be opened up to me and i'm excited to sort of see my first movie in that genre and uh, see where that takes us so i'm looking forward to that Uh, What if people want to send us any recommendations, both for beers and or episodes? Well, as always, uh, if you haven't already, you can follow us on social media, Twitter, Instagram, at the BMB podcast. We'd love to hear from you there. If you prefer to send an email, it's the BMB podcast at gmail.com. Or slide into our DMs in the aforementioned social media. Either way, we'd love to hear from you. We are currently taking requests or suggestions for our second season because we're almost at the end of our first season here. Yeah, we only got two episodes left now. That's right. Two more to go. Then we're taking a little summer break. Until next week, thank you so much for listening. I'm Cooper. And I'm Nolan. And we'll see you next time on Bad Movies and Beer. Keep it sappy. Nice planet. We'll take it.